Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of the Covenant. I want to welcome everybody joining us on Facebook Live as well. A few announcements for you. As always, the QR code is available for uh, our good folks on Facebook to check in and let us know that you're with us in worship this day. You'll also find some other information along with that QR code. Um, we are scheduled to have our parking lot um, redone on the 17th, 18th, and 19th. So we're giving you uh, a little heads up, not this week, but next week, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, weather permitting. Um, the church parking lot will be torn up and taken care of and resurfaced, so we're looking forward to that. It's been a long time in coming. Um, there will be no access, or the building will be inaccessible during the day on those days, just simply because we don't have a great way to bring people into the building other than through the main office entrance. Um, if you want to come in and you need to come in for some reason, just give us a call in the office and we'll, we'll, we'll get you in. The meetings that are scheduled for that night are going to go on, or those three nights are going to go on as regularly scheduled. So session is on the 17th and I know there's a meeting or two on the 19th as well. So weather permitting, the 17th, 18th, and 19th uh, we'll be redoing the parking lot and on the 20th we should be able to park on it. So we're looking forward to that. That was what was up there. Good, okay. Uh, men's choir um, is practicing today after worship here in the sanctuary. Also, next Sunday before worship at 9 a.m., you'll be singing next Sunday for Father's Day, so we're looking forward to this. Uh, men's choir, just a reminder, after worship today, practice, and then next Sunday before worship. Uh, we've been partnered with our West Bayfront for a while, but we're partnered now in a specific project, a home renovation that is happening here just down the street from us, right in our neighborhood. Um, we're looking for volunteers to help out. On June 12th and 13th, there are, I guess, morning shifts and afternoon shifts, um, half day and full day. You could work two full days uh, if you'd like to. Um, if you want to be a part of this, you can contact Seth Coomer. We've already done quite a bit of work on the home as well as our neighbors working on the home. So if this is something that you're interested. It's a way to continue our investment, uh, continue our outreach and building relationships with our neighbors. So please contact Seth Coomer if you're interested in participating. Our West Bayfront is happening Wednesdays in June and July, 8 p.m. at Bayview Park can enjoy the view of the bay. There's all sorts of things that are going on. Um, Birch Farms Market, meet our neighbors. There's some games, things of like this going on. If you want to participate, um, contact Seth. Um, this is a, a, a great way for us, again, to meet our neighbors and to be involved in our community. Sunday Suppers is coming. The sixth, well, it's coming every Sunday, but particularly the 16th, uh, we will be hosting and serving. And I got a note from Pat earlier this morning that we are looking for two or three volunteers uh, to help out, as well as we are looking for five or six desserts. So volunteers are needed from 3.15 to 6 p.m. to prepare uh, food to serve, and um, if you want more information, if you want to help out, please see Pat. Pat's in her usual spot right there, so please um, call or text or run up to Pat after the service and say, I would love to help out. We have a special announcement that we're going to put up there, and um, this is the picture in which no one could identify Pastor Chris last Sunday during the children's message. And so your task is to identify which of these five people is Pastor Chris. The one on the left. It wasn't, it wasn't that hard, was it? It wasn't that hard. Yeah, pre-marriage, pre-goatee, pre-contacts, and you can't tell under the hat because I had hair like Seth back then. But, um, so, we just wanted to give you a chance to see how good looking I was so long ago. So, anyway, <laughs> take it down, please. All right, that was Monty's idea, so. Actually, I think it was Dale Sweet's idea. Where's Dale? There he is, right there in the back. Dale, yeah, so, he's like, we should put that up and have people see what he used to look like when he was young and had energy. Okay, that's enough silliness for this morning. Let's join together in our call to worship. You'll find it in your bulletin. It's a one sentence and one sentence response. Our help is in the name of the Lord. 
Let's stand together as we sing our first hymn, selection number 394. Cleansing love, God invites our confession, offering mercy and strength so that we may start anew. Let us pray together the prayer of confession. Let us pray. In the waters of baptism, O God, you have cleansed us and claimed us. Forgive us for refusing your grace and rejecting your name. We have followed our own paths they have led us far from you. Help us to live into our baptisms, to trust that all we need is in you, for you have marked us as your own, loving us without limit. Wash us with your love again, that with clean hearts we may go in the way of Jesus. In Christ Jesus, we are a radically renewed community. Thanks be to God. Old things are done away with. All things become new. Thanks be to God. 
We are agents of grace and reconciliation. Thanks be to God. With every step or stumble, Christ will be with us. Thanks be to God. And now let us share a sign of God's love with one another as we pass the peace. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Good morning. Please join me in the first reading, a reading from Isaiah 56, verses 6 through 8. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servant, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. a kid, you can come on and join me here on the steps.
Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Go ahead, can come right here. Oh, right here. Before we go to kids' church, I know we're ready to go to kids' church. We're just going to bypass this moment. <laughs> they must have been scared of that picture last week. <laughs> Come on. Everybody's in their summer dresses this morning. Well, except you. But you're looking handsome and dapper as always. <laughs> All right. Welcome, welcome. I have a question. Did you guys ever see the movie? It's called Raya and the Last Dragon. Have you guys heard that movie? Okay. <laughs> Two times. I think I have you beat. You can watch it every Tuesday. All right, I love it. Um, what do we love about that movie? I love where the dragon comes out. <gasps> and they all fall oh, yeah, at the very end. Yeah, yeah. What do you like about the movie? The sad part and a good part. Okay, tell me. Oh, yeah, when her, her dad turns into stone, yeah. Oh, we love the dragons. The dragons are awesome. I can't blame you guys for liking the dragons. Here's what I love about the movie, besides the dragons, because the dragons are pretty cool. But I like how in the movie, at each part, remember, she stops at a different place along her journey, right? And she's trying to find all of these like stones to put back together the main stone, right? And then they fight, yeah. Oh, I like that everyone gets peace at the end. That's a good one. But they get, they are looking for these stones and they're going to different locations. And along the way, they meet different people who help them. Rhea meets the dragon, and then she meets friends along the way. And in the movie, they're not supposed to become friends, right? They're supposed to be enemies. They're supposed to be completely different from one another. But because they meet one another, yeah, because they meet one another, they are changed for the better. In our story today, we have a story about two people meeting who are so different from one another that it makes no sense for them to even be talking to one another. But when they come together, they are both changed and they understand that God's spirit is at work for the good of all people, no matter who they are or where they come from. And the other person is changed because they know that they are finally accepted and loved. I love stories that bring us together. So we're going to talk about that story when we go into Kids Church. But let's just thank God for good stories about people coming together for peace, for hope, and for love. All right, let's pray. Dear God, you are awesome. You have amazing stories. To tell us and for us to tell. Lord, help me understand how I am part of it all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, now it's time for Kids Church, so you can go over and you'll meet Monty over there. I miss doing that. (laughs) 
We're continuing in our series, uh, Faces of Our Faith, and we'll be looking at different characters throughout Scripture, both Old and New Testament, and generally characters we don't hear much about through uh, a regular preaching of the lectionary texts. And so, as you picked up from uh, Brittany's children's message, uh, we're going to be looking at an unusual text from uh, the book of Acts. It's one of the most actually interesting texts because the church is uh, in, in its first days, and all of these crazy, amazing things are happening because the Holy Spirit's come. And so we're going to be reading from Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 38. Before we read, let's pray together. Oh Lord, as we look at these different faces of our faith, may we see, see our own face reflected back to us. May we find our own stories in the story of Scripture. May we find the same spirit that moved amongst the early church, moving within our church and within our very hearts. Lord, be with us. Open our eyes to your word for us this day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Then the angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to, Jerus he had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask you, does this prophet say this? About himself or someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's some water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop. And both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water. And Philip baptized him. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> In the book of Acts, we encounter more people from more different places than anywhere else in Scripture, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament. And it all starts with Pentecost Sunday. The Scripture, a few chapters ahead of this, says there were people gathered from many nations in Jerusalem at that time. Nations that we don't really understand who Cyrenes are or these folks, but the modern-day nations represented would be places like Iraq and Iran, Syria, Israel, Palestine, Egypt, Libya, Greece, Turkey, and Italy. Everyone from around the known world around the Mediterranean basin was gathered in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit made the disciples bold. We know Peter that when he was confronted before Jesus' death, he denied Jesus three times. Then the Spirit comes after Jesus' death and resurrection and everything changes. All of a sudden, Peter, who's denied Jesus three times, becomes bold. He speaks prophetically in front of the leaders of Jerusalem, gets himself in a little trouble. He also heals and proclaims good news to everybody he comes across. The Holy Spirit was on the loose, as my friend Harold Kurtz used to say. When the Holy Spirit's on the loose, you just have to follow along. And that's exactly what Peter and the other disciples did. We join the story here after Stephen, 
Do you remember the story of Stephen? Stephen was really the first martyr of the church. He was stoned. He proclaimed in front of the Sanhedrin the Messiahship of Jesus Christ, the Lordship of Jesus, and it made them really mad. So much so that they killed him. And at Stephen's death, all the disciples were scattered for fear of their lives. They went all over the place, into Turkey, down into Egypt. They went farther west into what is present-day Iran. They just simply scattered. And so we pick up the story here with Philip. Here we have Philip. Philip had fled to the city of Samaria. Samaria should sound familiar. Samaria, Samaritan, same thing. He fled to Samaria. And as he talked about Jesus, as he said Jesus was the Messiah, many people heard and believed, even Samaritans. Not only did he proclaim good news, he healed people. He touched them, and they were healed of their afflictions, both physical and spiritual. This Holy Spirit was doing amazing things through those first followers of Jesus. The angel of the Lord, it says, the angel of the Lord said to Philip, go, right, get up and go, get up and go south on the wilderness road between Jerusalem and Gaza, right, there's not much on a wilderness road, that's why it's called the wilderness road, take this road, go and do, and what does it say, he got up and he went, Philip gets up and goes, and along the way as he's going down this wilderness deserted road he comes across a chariot and the spirit says to Philip go over to that chariot and join it so it says what Philip gets up and he goes and he joins the chariot and there he finds the Ethiopian reading we meet this Ethiopian gentleman in Luke's day, and that doesn't mean too much to us, but in Luke's day, the Ethiopian would have been a sort of a person from like the ends of the earth, um, a very exotic person, if you will, if we can use that term. Even in Homer's Odyssey, it talks about the Ethiopians from the great and distant ends of the earth. So Ethiopian, often in Greco-Roman literature, referred to somebody of dark skin. So for our folks from Turkey and Italy and Greece and Jordan and Israel and Palestine to meet someone from Ethiopia or an Ethiopian would have been it would have, it would have been a memorable encounter and so here we have this story recorded in the book of Acts that the spirit comes upon Philip and says to Philip go and join this chariot and there he meets this Ethiopian we don't know much about him we're given a few clues as to who this person is well, he seems to be a person of prominence. He's in charge of the treasury for the queen of Ethiopia. We know, it says in our scripture, that he was worshiping in Jerusalem. So we can surmise a couple things. Perhaps he was Jewish, probably not. But he's more likely a God-fearer. And he was in Jerusalem to worship, and now we find him on his way home, back to Ethiopia. Spirit said, go and join that chariot. So he runs up, right? Doesn't know what he's going to say. He hears him reading something. Uh, do you know what you're reading? Do you understand what you're reading? I can't understand. Unless somebody explains this to me. Right? There's a lot of par parts of the Old Testament where we feel that way. I don't understand what you're saying here. I don't understand this unless someone explains it to me. So he explains this passage. And this passage is an entree into Jesus as Lord, Jesus as Messiah, his death and his resurrection. And so Philip unpacks the story of Jesus for this Ethiopian eunuch. This should sound somewhat familiar. It's almost as an interesting sort of parallel also in the Gospel of uh, Luke about Jesus on the road to Emmaus, right? Two are, men are going down the road and they explain to Jesus incognito, right? Oh, all these things that are happening. How could you not know what's going on? And they explain, this is what's happened. And Jesus is known right in the breaking of the bread. And all of a sudden, they, they understand. 
The product of this conversation with Philip is that the Ethiopian wants to be baptized, and they're riding along, I assume they're riding along, and there's some water. Hey, here's some water. What's to prevent me from being baptized? And Philip, nothing. And so they go down in the water, and Philip baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch. It's another step in the story of the book of Acts, right? The story, the idea that the good news is going to be proclaimed where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And here we see the story start to spin out from Jerusalem, from Judea, Samaria, we heard from Philip, and to the ends of the earth. It's already happening. So as I was thinking about this, this text this week and sort of thinking about faces of our faith, I was really struggling with what do we say about the Ethiopian in this story? What do we say about the Ethiopian in this story? We know a few things about him, right? He's from a far off land. He's a eunuch. He has an important job. But what did he really do in the story? I mean, he was reading and someone came up, Philip, and asked him a question and he learned a little bit more and basically the Ethiopian says, I, hey, I want to be baptized. I mean, when it comes to stories, what did he actually do? He actually didn't do a whole lot in this story. He's just going home. <laughs> He's on his way home, and by the power of the Spirit and Philip's hearing, all of a sudden he has this encounter. He doesn't really do a whole lot in the story. He's kind of like we are when it comes to certain things, right? We don't, when it comes to our faith and our journey, sometimes we don't do a whole lot. Don't worry, we'll make that more understandable. When we look at the story, Philip really doesn't do much either. If you think about it. He asks the question, do you understand what you're reading? The Ethiopian says, well, not really. I need someone to help me understand. And then Philip explains. The Ethiopian was baptized because Philip listened to the Holy Spirit and followed. Actually, twice. We think about Philip in this story, right? The angel of the Lord says, get up and go on the wilderness road. So he gets up and he goes. And as he's going along, the Spirit, Holy Spirit comes to Philip and says, see that chariot? Go over to it and join it. And he goes over to the chariot and he joins it. All Philip does in this story really is listen. Half of his story is listening. The other half is explaining. In this story... This is why I was struggling, because the the idea of faces of our faith, the Ethiopian really doesn't do much. Philip listens, but the protagonist, the person of action in this story is God. It's the Holy Spirit. It's God through the angel of the Lord. It's God through the Holy Spirit who's really the protagonist in this story. This is where the action is centered. Without the angel of the Lord, without the Holy Spirit, nothing like this happens. It's a non-story. It's not included in the book of Acts. The main character in the story is God. The angel of the Lord told him, go down the road. The Holy Spirit said, go over to the chariot. I think one of the reasons why this story is in Acts, one, is because it gives us the idea, the idea we know now that the gospel is moving outside of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, now into the ends, what were considered then the ends of the earth. But I think it also reminds us that our journeys aren't standalone. Our faith journeys, our faith lives, our own lives. We're not independent entities, unaffected by anyone else around us or unaffected by God. Then in ways perhaps we know or don't know, God is at work in our lives and in the lives of those around us in such a way that we're shaped and formed as followers of Jesus Christ. Each of our own faith journeys has been shaped by faithful others. Think about that. Take a moment and let's think about how has your spiritual life, however you want, whatever you want to call it, your spiritual life, your faith journey, your life in the church, how has it been shaped and informed by others? Perhaps it's a Sunday school teacher. Perhaps it's a coach, 
a parent, a grandparent, a youth group leader. Perhaps it's a chaperone on a youth trip. It can be anybody. It can be anyone. How has your life been shaped, molded, directed in faith by other people? And it's not just other people, it's actually the Holy Spirit working through those people. You know, <clears throat> the older I get, the more I realize I can, I can sort of look back. I have a lot more to look back at probably than I look, have to look forward to at my age now. There's a lot more back than there is ahead. But I look back and I think about a conversation I might have had with somebody that at the time seemed innocuous. It was just, oh, sort of, okay, whatever. And I think back on it now, 20 or 30 years later, and that was an important conversation in my life. Or a teacher. Mr. Reisner, my art teacher in elementary school, had an, it was one incident on one day that had a powerful effect on me. We had, um, every once in a while, he would give us a few things, and you had to work in silence, and you had to create something out of a piece of paper, a pipe cleaner, I mean, right, elementary art, pipe cleaner, paste, piece of paper, some other things. And I remember I made, on this piece of paper, it was like a baseball field or something like that. And I remember him saying, this was back in fifth grade, so this would have been back in, what, 70, I don't know, 77 or 78. No one's ever done anything like this before. That has stuck with me. He said, that's really creative. He's like, you're really creative. No, one ever t no one's ever said that to me since. <laughs> no one's certainly ever said that to me before. So it sticks right here. That was a really important moment in my life. 30-second conversation. I can remember it to this day. We all have incidents or conversations or encounters or people in our lives who've shaped us along the way. Back in 1994, the associate pastor of the church I was attending, we were working at a, at a house like we were going to be working here with our West Bay front. And Don said to me, he said, Chris, you have, you have some gifts for ministry. You should consider going to seminary. And I kind of laughed in his face. I'm like, Nah, that's, that's not for me. Well, that little conversation obviously planted a seed, and he had the last laugh. These little things that happen along the way. That conversation that I had with Don spun into more conversations, and eventually to my saying, sure, I'm, I feel like I'm called to go to seminary. And sometimes along the way, we get these amazing positive words right, from people led by the Spirit that shape and mold us. Now, there's a counter story to the seminary story because I went to my dad and I said, Dad, I really feel like I'm called to go to seminary. And his words, quote, forgive me, why the hell would you want to do that? <laughs> That's a direct quote from my father. Why would you want to do that? Well, so time goes by and obviously the proof is in the pudding and it was the right thing to do we don't live in silos we can't live unaffected by those around us we don't live unaffected by the holy spirit and the holy spirit's work in your own life in the life of those around you who shape and mold us and help direct our lives i think that's part of the reason why this story is here we never hear again from the ethiopian eunuch there's some old um, old, old, old church histories that are written that said, oh, this, he became a bishop in the church of Ethiopia. We have no idea. But we never hear from this person again. But his life has dramatically changed. All he's doing is going down the road, going home. We never know how God, someone else, the Holy Spirit, will interrupt our lives. The story is an important story because Philip was willing to listen to the Spirit and go. He could have listened to the Spirit and said, eh, I don't want to go down the wilderness road. He listened 
and went. And the Ethiopian followed the prompting of the Spirit through Philip and was baptized. Faith isn't just believing the right stuff, right? We make it sound like that. You've got to check all the boxes, believe the right things, and um, that's sort of how we, we do Christian education. It's sort of how we do confirmation. It's how we do a lot of things. That's part of it, but it's not all of it. It's not just checking off the right boxes and believing the right things, as important as that is. It's about following the Lord's leading. It's about listening, discerning the Spirit and saying, I'm going to do what the Spirit's telling me to do even if I have to go down a wilderness road. This chance encounter, right, is no chance at all. It's not a coincidence. It didn't just happen. It happened because the Spirit moved. Philip listened. The Ethiopian listened. And both lives were dramatically changed. That same Spirit that moved then is the same Spirit that moves today. Is the same spirit that speaks to you through scripture, through prayer, through your neighbor, through your friends. It's the same spirit that we discern, try to discern together as a church in ministry. That same spirit that sent Philip out is the same spirit that's here. Thanks be to God. God is good. And all the time. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Your Spirit which appears, prods, interrupts, shoves us, pulls us, draws us into relationships. The Spirit that brings people together. Those good folks in Jerusalem who each heard their own language coming from others. Those who came to faith from all these different backgrounds, you draw together in unexpected ways. Lord, that same spirit moves today and speaks to us, speaks through your church, speaks through your word and prayer and discernment. And we're grateful for that. Lord, when you speak, may we be found listening. And when we listen, may we follow. We may find ourselves just like the Ethiopian, going about our daily business, heading home, going to work, going to the store, on a phone call, texting, whatever it might be. And all of a sudden we have an in, some sort of encounter Perhaps we don't realize it at the time, but we realize it when we look back on it, that that was a divine moment. We're grateful for those divine moments. They remind us that faith isn't simply studying history or what happened 2,000 years ago. Faith isn't simply knowing facts about the Bible or Jesus. But it's being in a relationship and listening and hearing and following. We live in a noisy world, O oh Lord, where we're constantly being bombarded with messages. How we should vote, how we should do certain things, what we should believe, that what actually happened, well, what didn't actually happen. And we're constantly bombarded with messages and sound bites. And it's easy for it to just be confusing and just to be a bunch of noise. I pray, Lord, that in the, the times of silence that we do have, when we wake up in the morning or when we go to sleep at night, when we're have driving in the car with the radio off and not looking at our phones. That in those moments of silence, we would know and feel your presence. Perhaps it's a walk at Presque Isle, or it's in the midst of silence in a sanctuary. Lord, we long for that connection. So speak to us through your spirit. May we know your presence. 
And may we be people of your presence. Where we take a few moments for a time of silent prayer before you. Lord, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers for the world. Hear our prayers for our nation, for our loved ones, our spouses, our children, our grandchildren, our parents and grandparents. Hear our prayers for those whom we know are struggling today, and struggling with health issues or other issues. We offer our prayers up to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite Bill Holmes, our clerk of session, forward as we're going to have officer ordination and installation for our new class of elders, deacons, and trustees. So if you are a new elder, deacon, or trustee, I actually ask you to come forward and we'll have you on the steps here. Bill, do you have your, do you have your microphone? Okay, come on up here. <clears throat> we are grateful to have almost everyone with us. Julie Little is on vacation and she couldn't be here with us, but we will install her um, at the next appropriate time. Hear these words. There are different gifts, but the same Spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving, but it's the same Lord who is served. God works through different persons in different ways, but it is the same God who achieves His purpose through them all. Each one is given a gift by the Spirit, to use for the common good. Together, we are the body of Christ and individually members of him. Though we have different gifts together, we are in ministry, a ministry of reconciliation led by the risen Lord Jesus Christ. We work and pray to make his church useful in the world. We call men and women of faith so that in the end every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Within our common ministry, some members are chosen for particular work as teaching elders, ruling elders, deacons, trustees. In ordination, we recognize these special ministries, remembering that our Lord Jesus said this, whoever among you wants to be great must become the servant of all. And whoever wants to be the first must be last of all and servant of all. Susan Evans to be ordained and installed as ruling elders, and Rachel Holmes and Diane Sutton to be installed as ruling elders. Sophia Janader and Mary Lynn Hall to be ordained and installed as deacon, and Darcy Janader and Cindy Kirchhoff to be installed as deacons. Thank you. God has called you by the voice of the church to serve Jesus Christ in a special way. Please respond to the following questions as your affirmation of your desire to serve. Do you trust in Jesus Christ as your savior Acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you? 
Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus in the church universal and God's word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you? Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? Will you pray, excuse me, <clears throat> will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? Okay, this question is for elders. Will you be a faithful elder watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in the government and discipline? serving in councils of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? This is for deacons. Will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? Do we, the members of the church, Accept Ron Fabich and Susan Evan, Rachel Holmes and Diane Sutton as ruling elders, and Sophia Janader, Darcy Janader, Cindy Kirchhoff, and Mary Lynn Hall as deacons, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Do we? Do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church. Do we? <clears throat> Mr. Moderator, yes. speaking for the people of the church, I bring Ray Fritz, Jennifer Kobe, Marlene Metzler, and Barb Max to be rec recognized as trustees. Congratulations on your election to serve as trustees for this congregation. Will you seek to be faithful trustees, seeking God's wisdom and direction in the stewardship of our physical resources? Will you? Do we, the members of the church, accept Ray Fritz, Jennifer Kobe, Marlene Metzler, and Barb Max as trustees, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation, to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Do we? Wonderful. I'd like to invite um, our elders forward. We're going to lay hands on um, those who are newly ordained. So we have, who as far as elders, Sue Evans, a new elder. I'm looking, Ron Fabish, thank you. Sophia Janader, deacon. We have one more, Mary Lynn Hall. And others, come on, just come on right here. You can come on down too. As our elders come forward, we lay hands on everybody, not just them. We lay them on everyone because we all need the Spirit. We all need the Lord's power. We're just going to pray for our elders. And if you're sitting out here, you're not an elder, you can extend your hand if you feel comfortable doing so. And we will pray for our new class of officers. Let's pray together. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you thanks and praise. Throughout the ages and in every place, you've chosen servants from among your people to point the way to salvation by your grace. We are grateful for our ancestors in faith who followed without fear, placing their trust in you alone, for judges and monarchs who ruled in righteousness and peace, for prophets and apostles who spoke your bold words of mercy and of truth, for leaders and teachers in every age 
who have nurtured your people in faith and faithfulness. Above all, we praise you for Jesus Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life to set others free. Anointed by your Holy Spirit, he proclaimed your reign on earth, revealing your saving love in all that he said and did. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon your servants, <clears throat> Ron, Sue, Sophia, and Mary Lynn, whom you've called by baptism as your own. Grant them the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Give them joy in their walk of faith and a sure sense of your abiding presence for their work of ministry. Lord, we also give thanks for those of your, for, for your servants, Rachel, Diane, Darcy, and Cindy, as they continue in ministry to which you have called them. Help them to rely on the gifts of your spirit and to follow faithfully the calling of Jesus Christ. Give them the spirit of truthfulness that they may show the compassion of Christ in the actions of daily living and rightly, and rightly govern your people. Give your wisdom to our trustees, O Lord. Bless their work. Bless the work of Ray and Jennifer, Marlene, and Barb. Gracious God, pour out your spirit of power and truth upon your whole church, upon each officer gathered here, and upon those who are already serving their terms. Sustain your church in ministry. Ground us in the gospel. Secure our hope in Christ. Strengthen our service to the outcasts and increase our love for one another. Show us the transforming power of your grace in our life together, that we may be effective servants of the gospel offering a compelling witness in the world to the good news of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You're now ruling elders, deacons, and trustees of the Church of Jesus Christ, and for this congregation, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through the Father. Amen. Let's welcome them. Yay. Let us continue our offering of thanks and praise by offering our gifts to the church and our Lord and Savior.
Good and gracious God, your Holy Spirit knows no bounds. Your Spirit moves where it wills. Your generosity knows no bounds, O Lord, for you have been generous with us. And in joy and thanksgiving, we return a portion to you for your kingdom, for this church, for the feeding of the hungry, for those who are in need. Lord, bless these gifts. May these gifts be good news. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's remain standing as we sing our last hymn, selection number 838. Friends, no matter where you go this week, know that the Spirit is with you. As we leave this place, may we leave to love and serve our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.